This is my presentation on DLL injection, or otherwise referred to as DLL hooking, as the part that I'm mainly going to talk about. Um, I'm Eric Hildreth. Cody Pritchard's in the audience. Uh, a lot of the pictures are taken from his slides because pictures are going to be a theme in this presentation because I don't want to explain it in words. So DLL injection. Uh, the term, if you Google this or go to the wiki, is basically the process of taking a, a child process, expanding it, sticking a DLL in there, making it basically load the DLL that the other project's doing, and that's the injection portion. What I'm mainly going to talk about is actually after you do the injection, how you override those functions to do what you want uh, to do. Little preface about the way my project and what I'm talking about, this is actually outside the realm of the C++ standard, so you get into the compiler and the project and 32-bit or 64-bit. So this was all done, x86, uh, assembly or, yeah, registers, Win32, uh, DLLs, and all in Visual Studio uh, 2012. Um, using the base, everything is in standard call. I didn't run into anything that I had to use CDECL for. Um, and it's all 32-bit registers. I don't use any floating point registers or anything fancy. Um, so we're going to do a really fast review, and this is awesome because you've all taken 391, except maybe you. Uh, you haven't taken 391? All right, this, so bear with me then. So we're going to review registers. Uh, we're going to go over the stack. Uh, when I say go over the stack, you'll see, not really, but we'll talk about it. Uh, and then a little bit about the calling convention. So these are our registers uh, up here. We have our standard, our multi-purpose registers, our general purpose registers, sorry. Yeah. And uh, these are the ones we actually care about for this project because we're going to abuse these a lot to get what I want done. Um, so our instruction pointer, this points at where code is being read from into the processor, the assembly, it's taking it, loading it up, running it. This is supposed to stay at looking at code that is executable. It has access to be read and being sent to the processor all times. You cannot directly move this register, you have to do it by either calls, jumps, or branches, which just a different type of jump. And that's important to note that you can't physically manipulate this without using an assembly directive unless you want to do some fancy find this register somewhere in memory and try and manipulate it yourself. But you don't have to do that. Uh, the stack pointer, um, the stack pointer is more than a pointer, which we'll talk about when we get into the stack, uh, but it basically keeps track of where all of our variables are uh, for the entire, for all the functions, it's nested functions, every time you recurse down, it keeps stacking them and then and comes back. Uh, and then, yeah, to give you an idea, uh, there's an entire presentation for this for 391 that I'm going to spend five minutes talking about. Uh, the frame base pointer, so this is what we use to find out uh, where the return addresses are in the stack and to keep track of where variables for, where local variables are stored in functions and where the arguments are passed to functions where they are kept on the stack. We can use the uh, frame base pointer to kind of get an idea or know exactly where some of these things are in the stack. Uh, and so the calling convention, standard call. Standard call cleans up its own stack. CDECL expects you to clean up the stack after you call these. Those are really the only two differences that we care about. The main thing is, is that function parameters are always, are for both, are passed left to, or right to left, and they're returned by the AX register. There's a little side note of that that I will talk about later. So the stack. We can push onto the stack, which moves the stack forward four bytes or backwards because it grows down. Uh, this is where anytime a local variable at the front of a, or in a function needs to be allocated, it will push however many variable space it needs to allocate all those variables. Also, when you before you call a function in the assembly, it pushes them on and then calls the function so that they're there in memory and they know exactly where they are on the stack. Popping off just moves the stack pointer back. So the stack pointer is keeping track of where it's supposed to be, and when you pop, it goes back, oh, well, this is where I'm supposed to be now. And that's where the, this uh, ESP register actually keeps track of. It jumps back through the stack. 
uh, calling. So calling is a special one. We can move the uh, instruction pointer with this guy. He, uh, when you call, it puts a copy of the instruction pointer on the stack and then moves the instruction pointer to the address of the function. And that's important because it is a jump, but it also gives us a current version of where the stack is right when it's called. Uh, ret is the opposite. It will go to, it takes the frame base pointer, which is right in front of the return address, pops that guy off, looks at the return address, jumps back to where it is, and then, yes, and that's it for that. I think there's a little more, I can't remember. So, this is the stack in a picture. Uh, what we have here is, if we were to call these functions in order, so we have main, which calls bar. Bar takes three parameters, so they've been pushed on in order, from right to left. Right to left, yes. And then, foo doesn't take any, so there's none between here, but it allocates two variables internally for the stack. So they're on this side, here. So what we have here is what this looks like for the stack pointer and the uh, frame base pointer. Stack pointer is all the way currently out here. If we were to pop this, it would come back, and we'd pop it again, it would come back, and it would just keep going back. And then we can keep using that pointer to look at where these are. The frame base pointer, we can tell where each function is. So what we can actually do, if we wanted to go back from foo and look at bar's parameters, we're passed to it. We can go, well, I'm currently in foo. I'm going to look at my return address, my, my frame base pointer. I'm going to dereference it, come back here. And then I know that the return address is one or four bytes over. And then I know my args are right after that. So by knowing something about the particular functions that you're using, you can actually pull your parameters off of the stack. So that was the stack. Now we're going to actually talk about what my project was about. So my project is about injection. I call it injection. It's also referred to the main focus as hooking functions. Because I'm actually, and that's what I call a lot of the APIs just because it's simpler to realize or talk about. So the easiest way is we can just call a function. We can just hook into it and say, OK, when I hook into it, I'm just going to call this function, and then I'm going to go back to it, and I'll be done. I'm not going to do anything. This is great for if you want to just track maybe how often a function is called. You jumps to a specific function that you hooked in for WSA startup for WinSock. And it says, OK, I can track how many times this has been called. And it's a simple function. You don't have to do anything special. The other two require a bit more nuances. Um, so we're capturing and modifying the parameters to the function. We can take, we can just look at them, and then you can actually write tests against them. Uh, I found that I could write a pretty cool tests against anything that takes a pointer. I can do try and catches around valid memory to make sure you're not about to cause an exception by passing the things to these functions you shouldn't be. And then capture the return value. You can uh, track errors. So if something returns an error, you can keep track of this. Maybe they don't handle it. Uh, you can also change it, what the error is. So the main two focuses of this are capturing is for debugging, but for modifying is for creating like a simulation. I'll talk more about that a little later. The one thing I didn't do, because um, basically I just didn't get around to it, is so a lot of functions will pass parameters as out parameters. Well, you, st you want to check those after the function runs to see what they're re essentially returning to the caller. Uh, and that really, with the combination of these two, you could get to that very easily. So this is where the, the hooking starts, is with the simple jump. This is from CS391. The, uh, I will explain this real quick. So main, we have hooked Winsock or WSA startup with my WSA startup. So main calls, main calls in WSA startup. We have WSA startup, the original version right here. It's got its three assembly instructions and it starts pushing on its variables that it has in, uh, for local. Well, what I've done, I've gone and replaced this with that jump, which is to this guy. So this goes over here, then runs my code. There's some other stuff we'll talk about in a minute that it's then 
finishes running code, goes to a, basically a handle that takes care of getting back to the original function. So it goes there, then it goes to that and jumps back and executes the original function. So this function does something. This is just the, the call function. So that does something, maybe tracks how often WSA startup is called, um, does a timestamp for how, like, if you want to do performance. And then it executes this guy. And then what happens is, is this actually returns, and that's what this is, this returns to him, and he actually then returns back to this guy. So main, the original program that called WSA startup, has no idea what's going on on this side. And that's kind of the, the underlying purpose behind the DL injection hooking is that this can be a pre-existing executable that's loading a DLL, but we're just going to modify the DLL so we don't have to mess up main or have main be recompiled. One of the things to note is that these instructions, this move to itself is essentially no op. And then this happens at the front of every function because this is where the function got called, the return address got pushed onto the stack, we pushed the frame pointer down to store it, and then the frame pointer gets pushed onto the stack, and that's where you get the frame pointer, return address, args. So we've jumped and we've taken that out. So we have to make sure we still do that. So this is where we, uh, what this is actually, this is a executable code. So this is in programs memory space. You normally can't touch this. If you try to read it or even write to it, you will throw an exception. So what we have to do to this WA startup function is we have to change the protection to it to writable. So we change the protection to whatever functions we're hooking to writable, put that jump in there, and then we put it back. Because we still want it to be in its original, as much as the original state as possible. When you're doing so for this guy right here, so this is all instruction pointers jumping around. Well, this handle over on the far side, that's something we allocate. So it's heap memory. But we need to run it as code. So when we allocate for this, we use virtual alloc. Then we can then use virtual protect on to make that also executable memory. So that means that the instruction pointer looks, when it's walking through all this, doesn't ever throw your uh, exception. The instruction pointer doesn't throw an exception for any of this walking around. And so that's, that's really all you have to do. You can, uh, basically for mine, I just allocate a large block of executable write and read memory, and then I keep making the little handles for each one I hook. Um, so that kind of answers the question earlier about the instruction pointer has to stay in code. Doesn't matter how that code is allocated or where it exists, as long as it's in execute read or execute read slash write. It's, it'll work. So this hooks and works for one function. This is great if you want to do like performance tracking of how often it's called. But didn't you modify the memory of the WSA startup though? Correct. So when you call virtual protect. You can call virtual protect on that? Yep. Even though you didn't allocate it. The DLL that gets loaded. Yes. Oh, too far. So we want to do more than just call a function. We want to hook. We want to run parameters. And potentially, you could run an array of functions at the front if you really wanted to. So the simple little handle that just says jump to me, push the register stack, and jump back won't function. So we made this nice little hook struct that has a lot of things in it that are all particular to the addresses of our hooking functions. So I'll kind of reference back to this as, as we go through the different steps of hooking. So this is the better hook process, and we're going to spend a little time on this slide. So what we've done here is we have our main block of code. So main calls install hook. And this can be for any particular function. It, doesn't, it actually doesn't specify. We're using, we're using WSA startup, but it doesn't actually have in here specific to that. So what we do is uh, we call the install hook, and it's going to allocate a new, uh, 
a new hook structure, the new hook struct that's got all those address stories that it can store in it. I didn't put it on here, but that actually, you would request that memory, either you would allocate that memory as executable, or you've already set up some memory manager that you just ask for blocks of memory. Um, sorry, that's, that's not right. The hook struct is not executable memory, it's all heap memory. But you need a new one for every function you're going to hook because there needs to be a specific one to set up the hooking for each function. This is what happens. So the virtual alloc, you need an executable buffer to what was the orig that original handle. The little, uh, just looks like the, it jumps to and jumps right back. But we needed to do a lot more because we need it to now set up this handle, these, this new hook, that, so we can get to it later. So the top of the, the X buffer we get in there is the, what we saw before is what we took out. So there was originally that no op, then we push the frame pointer, or we push the, the frame pointer down and then store it onto the stack. We still want to do that because we don't want to corrupt the original function. After that, we write the assembly code specific to setting the static pointer we have for a struct to this one we just made for this function. So there's one of these, there's one hook for every function we hook. And then after that assembly, we want it to then jump to a, back to a C++ environment, if you like, uh, that we can actually start writing code again. We don't have to keep writing an assembly. So then what this looks like, after this hooks runs, WSA startup gets ran. To set the jump point to the executable buffer is what that first jump is. So it jumps into that it's a block of memory I've allocated, but it's, it's been set to executable read. So the instruction pointer is walking through that. It's walking through the assembly that I put in this buffer. So it pushes this, the frame. It then pushes onto the stack. It takes the address that I have already knew about because I allocated it here and sets the static pointer to point to that, uh, to that particular hook. And then when that's done, it jumps over to this function. So this function then can say, oh, well, I can just now start looking at this static hook pointer, which has all the addresses for all the things that I care about. This is also important is that this is still a jump. This is not a call um, here, because a call would start pushing things on the stack. And we don't want the, to this point right here, there is nothing on the stack past this instruction, which is exactly what I removed from the original Winsock function. So what do we do with this now? So we have our handle in there. We got a struct that we could change depending on your API you want to do. You've, you've got a handle system. Well, now you can screw everything up. You do one wrong, miss things. You have exceptions thrown everywhere, which was fun debugging. One of the things that we're going to see a lot of is this decal spec naked and I put time on there. I think I was trying to make a joke. I don't know, it's not very funny. Uh, what this does is it basically it removes at the beginning of a function the pushing of registers and at the end of a function the popping of them. So at this point you have complete control. So when you jump to the head of this function, the first thing that gets executed is what the code you write. There is nothing holding your hand to say, I'm going to take care of your, register, your stack for you or your registers for you. What's nice about this is you can write this function with this type and just in a C++ environment and have your function there and you don't have to worry about writing an entire assembly block of code in, some, in the executable buffer like we did earlier, just this huge amount of hard-coded, weird assembly that isn't a whole lot of fun. So this is what we're talking about. Protects the stack and the registers, cleans up the stack and the registers. Uh, you don't have to do this with some of the functions because maybe you're not going to screw up stuff, but uh, you're, you will. You will end up doing it a lot uh, because you'll find that while it's nice for jumping to something and you get to control that entry level, a lot of the stuff you're going to need, you're going to have to eventually call something and you have to protect the registers because as soon as you call something and you haven't moved the stack pointer to the correct places, you just invalidate the previous functions. Um, 
So what's happened since we called WSA Startup? We've jumped twice. So we're, we're in run hooks. So WSA Startup jumped to our executable buffer. It run to jump hooks. And so right now, we, need to, we, we have the chance to write more code that um, we know that we're in the frame of this function. We know everything about uh, where, the return, where that function is going to return to. So we have our return address. We have the parameters with a little bit more knowledge, which we'll talk about there, of how many there are, how big they are, potentially. Um, so and then the question is the number of parameters, because that's really the important part, right? If, if you want to capture the parameters for a function, you have to have know how many are on the stack. Um, so this is what the onhook just for a call function looks like. So we would, this is that we've jumped to the onhook entry, push the prolog down to protect the registers, we call our function. It does, prints out, hey, you've called Winsock startup. Good job, epilogue. Now we have to leave this function. Now you can ret from a decal spec, but Reading would pop the stack. And we didn't push anything on the stack for this. Now you could change your API to where if your executable buffer that we read earlier, you could have it do calling convention if you wanted. But I just decided to stay with the simple jump um, just because it was all I needed. So this is the, uh, okay, so that's one of the things. So I decided to jump, but where do you jump back to? We're pushed, we are two functions away, two jumps away from our original place. So how do we know where the original function was? We have to store it. So in the install hook portion of it that we did earlier when we created the executable buffer, at that point, we have the pointer directly to the WSA startup function. So we know exactly where it starts. The jump back address happens to be five bytes past that pointer because that's where the jump instruction was, and we want to go right back to after that. So nicely, this guy has a jump back address stored in it, and we just store it at that time when we know where the address is. Also, for some of the things that, uh, if you're going to like the on entry function, which is a static method, you may want to actually push the, put that value to a static value so that it can also access it. It's not just stuck inside of this guy. So capturing or modifying return values. This is what it looks like when we're on, we've called main, WSA startup, and we've jumped now, we've gotten to our on hook entry. Um, this is what the stack would look like because we have not let Winsock, or we've not let WSA startup push any variables on the stack yet. So the actual, this might be misleading, the stack pointer is actually right here. And this is now open memory on the stack for us to kind of do what we want with. Um, you do have to make sure that you don't overrun the stack at this point. Um, if that's a potential problem, you can't allocate the stack to be larger at the beginning. So. Ah, yes. So one of the things is what we want here is we want to put something in here. So when this guy returns, we want to capture what he put in the EXA or the EAX register. Well, we have to leave this. We jump back to WSA startup and we let it run its entire code. Well, you have no idea where in the assembly it's going to return from. You could try and look at it in debug, but obviously once you go into release, it's all up in the air at that point where it decides it's going to do stuff. But we, we know that this guy is going to return to that address. It's going to send the instruction pointer back to the address listed next to the frame pointer. So why don't we just move that and have it jump to our other naked function that I forgot to name. So what do we do? We would, this should have a prologue because we don't want to screw up the AX register. We want to store it so that it can actually be returned later. We just move the AX register into the into our i variable. Now we can print this. We could store it. You can actually 
just now change what's in the EAX register if you wanted. And so now what will happen is this guy will jump back to main where the original return function was supposed to be. Also to keep in mind, when this thing, when you return from what WSA startup, the end of its function cleans this stack up for you. You don't have to do that in here because the ret takes care of it. Uh, so yes, if you wanted to change, one of the things I think about when I'm, students don't handle errors because they say it's never going to happen, I would love to do this to them. I will just change what it returns and it will make your program crash. Why did it happen? Because I made it happen. So that's a, it's a good way to, uh, to track debug or to make test cases that maybe you can't necessarily set up the simulation to do something because it's trying to test something in this, uh, on your machine that the pain in the ass to set up. So you just set DLL injection, just function, just return this every time. And then you can write test cases against that when that happens. Um, okay, so one of the things to keep in mind, when you return from a stack or when you turn from a function, you're sup the, if it's SCD call, it's supposed to clean up for you. Well, that's what this expects. This RTC check that Visual Studio or Microsoft Compiler allows you to put in there, what it does is just before it starts pushing on the parameters for WCA startup, it moves the stack pointer into the ESI pointer, ESI register. This is so it has a copy of this before it calls your function. And then afterward, it compares it again. So what this means is it expects these to be the exact same as they were here as they are here. So this should be cleaned up. One of the things I ran into is I was not using, I was not protecting the SI register from some of the functions I was calling while in my hooking process, and I was corrupting this. Uh, you'll get this error if you don't protect if you don't screw it up, the SI register, you will never trigger this. But it also gives us something kind of cool, is that when this function gets called, the SI register never gets, isn't changed yet. So we've gone into our function, the stack is completely the way it was, all the registers are the way it was when the function was called. For debugging, because this is not there during release build, you know exactly where the end of the parameters are on the stack. Because this was the stack pointer before we started pushing parameters. And the stack pointer is now where the return address is when we call. So you can take those two and evaluate the, this, the length of the parameters on there. There's one stipulation of that that I will go over at the end that Cody pointed out to me. Um, but it, this is for just debugging. If you want to test against the parameters that they were gave you for the API to see like, well, I only pushed on four parameters and you say that they're supposed to be five, you could do an assert on your debug at this point. So this was the fun one, which actually ended up being relatively simple. Capturing and modifying the function parameters. So a couple things about the function parameters. You don't know, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. So we're back at our function. And the idea here is, is that we want to figure out what these are, or potentially change them. So what are we going to do? Well, we're in here with a perfectly clean stack. We know everything up to this point, exactly what it is. We come into here, and it's like, OK. Well, first thing we're going to do is we're actually just going to look, take the stack pointer. We've got our EV, uh, we know where this guy is. We have it in a register. We can move over to here and start, oh, I don't have a copy, it should be next. Um, we're going to take those parameters, push them onto the stack, and then call our function that matches the same signature of this guy. So how many arguments do we have in this particular one? Well, Winsock says we have two, and main says we've pushed a variable on. And that's really cool when you have symbols and you know exactly what the code does because maybe you wrote the DLL, but for all intents and purposes, when you're looking at the stack trace, it looks like this. 
It's 12 bytes of data between these return addresses and the frame pointer. You really don't know how many parameters are passed to this guy without someone telling you ahead of time. So, said with symbols, you can potentially do some voodoo, which I think was maybe even how you, some, some, some Visual Studio magic that uh, will get the string of the function name and you could try and do like some tokenizing on the string, potentially getting like checking for how many commas there are and getting an actual number of parameters. This will not tell you what they are though, the types. Uh, it's just more of another way to check against how many parameters are actually passed to this thing. Um, I just went with the fact that I changed the API that when you want to set a capture parameter, you just tell me how many parameters there are. Since you're the one hooking the function and you're giving me a function you want to hook it with, you better know how many parameters there are because if it's one too less or one too many, it's going to push on the stack either one too many times or one not enough times and you'll just corrupt your stack, stack and it will immediately, it will crash. I think it has crashed every single time I've done it incorrectly as soon as you return from the function because it just says that you didn't clean up the stack correctly. So, copying args. We take our args and we push them. So first we do the prolog so that we protect the, the stack from us accidentally pushing or from the popping, for when this is going to get popped or whatnot, we just want to protect between these two, these boundaries. So we copy those. And then we call our function when the stack is right here. All right? So we do call, pushes the return address. This function puts its return register on here. It sees its args are passed on the other side of the return address. It is perfectly happy. This function runs, you just call it. You don't have to jump into it, you don't have to jump out of it. It returns, and when it returns, it cleans this guy up, and our stack pointer goes right back to where our prolog was in our current function, in our onhook function. So, we want to copy back. Now, if we were changing the parameters for the function for WSA startup, Maybe it's trying to do make version Winsock 3.9. It doesn't exist yet. So we want to put it down to 2.1 before it errors, or 2.2 before it errors. The thing is, the stack cleans itself up. The STD call, when you get back here, the stack pointer is right here. So where are our args? Well, they're still there. And there's one caveat to this that I will talk about at the end. Um, so just go get them. You have your stack pointer, you know where it is. Move over one, get arg2. Move over one more, get arg1. And write them back over in the stack where the other function was. One of the things to keep in mind, I'll, I'll reference back to the, the hooking struct. When you're installing the hook for the first time you allocate this, you're storing a lot of the information of where the addresses are for things. And then at the beginning of this potential function, depending on what you're doing, because you know where the address you also know where your stack is right at that point. You're holding on to this information to find where the args are and uh, for any potential. This really comes down to more of an API of what you want to do or how you want to do it. I used all unsigns because I just found it easier when dealing with assembly to use unsigned instead of pointers for the stuff I was doing. Um, if you like using pointers with assembly, you can do that to it too. It eventually, it basically, it's, it's an address. Everything's an address, and you can manipulate it as a pointer or as just a, an already dereferenced address. So one of the things I didn't talk about was the on return or on exit. Um, and like I mentioned before, is basically this would be a combination of really on return, you would jump to a function or call into a function you would have it return to a function that matches the signature of the, uh, your previous function, or the WSA startup. So you would have this guy return to something that knows about these two addresses. So the same thing would happen. When this guy returns, let's say he returns, or we have him jump to our, I'm actually gonna go back. Go faster, there it is. So returns to our naked guy right here, right? Well, the stack pointer is right here again. 
we can do the same thing. We can take the arguments and see what they got changed to. And we can potentially change them now as well. So if this guy modifies args and then returns them, so for instance, if you're calling receive and it passes a character pointer, you pass a character pointer to it and it fills your buffer up, you want to see what that buffer is for. Or you want to erase it. Or you want to do whatever you want. You want to put funny things in it and tell your students, no, I don't know what's wrong. So it's just a combination of the two. Um, it's just I didn't get to it for my API because I, I didn't need it. So what can be done with this? Debugging is the number one thing that I've seen this be used for. That's the easiest as well. It, all you really need, uh, or for profiling, actually. Because that just requires the one, you don't have to make a handle. You can just do the one function that it jumps to in the beginning, does work, jumps back to the original function, and calls it. And that's it. Well, once you start capturing parameters um, and manipulating return values, you can actually make the system run however you want. And so this is now you start getting into a simulation. This is the original purpose of me making this, was to do a simulation that would simulate network, either drop packets, which would be if you call send, you pass it parameters. I don't actually call the function inside, but I still return to you what you would expect it to have sent. So the packet never got sent, never reached the hardware, but for a newer software project, you think everything's good. So you would have to have some process that handles that. Or if you wanted to delay packets, and that's kind of where this guy comes around. This is specific to my API and what my project, so I didn't talk about it. Uh, this allows me, so when you call send, I take all your parameters and I store them. And then I return to you what should have sent. I never called the function. But I've, what I'm going to do is I've critical sectioned this function now, and I'm running a thread that's storing every time you call it. And then I'm going to call the function myself and send the packets then. So I can put whatever delay I want. I just have to queue them up. Um, and that's also where this bypass comes in so that maybe I want to call the function, but so I can do it either two ways. I can just call, I can jump to it where I know it's supposed to run and configure the stack however I know it's supposed to be. Or I can just call it again, let the hooking system catch up to it or catch it. But I've set this flag inside this hook struct for that function to say bypass this time. And if the persistent flag isn't set, it will next pass through. The next person who passes through it will automatically be back on. Well, I've also critical sectioned it, so I'm the only one in it. I'll turn the persistent back off, unlock it. So even if you were about to call it, the, the person, the original API that you're injecting into has no idea what's going on or that you've delayed them potentially. They might be able to performance monitor it that you've delayed them, but hopefully don't write something that bad. Um, and the idea is, is basically, this is a very specific implementation of the way I got it to work. And I did it specifically for the Winsock DLL, because I'm very familiar with it. I know what it's supposed to do. I've actually seen the C code that it's written in. Um, and so it was very easy for me and familiar to make up scenarios that this can be very useful for. Um, so one of the things I didn't touch on and because I didn't think about it because my entire API that I was using was 32-bit and they don't return anything larger than a 32-bit and they don't take any parameters that are larger than a 32-bit. So what happens when you pass, when you start dealing with a DLL that you want to inject that either returns a copy of something larger than an int or takes a parameter that's like, that's not a pointer but it's actually a 64-bit number. Well, it pushes on twice. It pushes on the high and the low of the 64-bit number if it passes as a parameter. So this becomes a problem when you're capturing params and you're expecting them all to be in four bytes. So one of the, if you want to also have your API handle this, you need to add not only how many arguments are there, but also the simplest way would just be an array of integers to say, so for every number that's in there, 
uh, this guy, oh, 1, 3, and 5, they're all 64-bit. So while I'm looping through, okay, 1, 64-bit, push twice. Oh, next one's not 64-bit, push once. Next one's 64-bit, push twice. And that's really all it comes down to it. The main thing to keep in mind is that while you don't have at runtime really any way of determining how many arguments or what size they are, the person is specifically hooking your function with the intention of capturing the parameters, and they have to know what they are. So he can easily tell you at the time when he's installing his hooks, or when I'm installing the hooks, to say, yep, yeah, this is three parameters. There's two of them are 64s. The other one is returning a 64-bit number or larger. This gets pushed on to the stack, and then the EAX register gets the pointer to where that is on the stack. So going back real quick, we talked about this. If this guy returns a 64-bit int, it is not in the EAX register. It is right here. And it has just clobbered the arguments because for all it knows, it's returning. It doesn't need its arguments anymore. Now, so you'd have to, you'd have to mess with the stack a little bit more, maybe potentially, you know what it's supposed to return. So you can put that out further you could say, oh, I know I've got two args for this, and I know that this guy will actually, he'll push onto the stack. So maybe what I'll do is, before I do ret, I'll take these guys and push them out two further, let it ret. So these guys are now over here. The returns here, EAX has the pointer to this guy, to this return. Well, I then set up, when it returns, it's like, oh, okay, well, instead of, me just going here and looking for the second arg, I also know what the capture param return value is. So I was like, okay, if I ever do this, that it's larger than an int, I know that I have pushed the size of whatever that structure is here, and if I still want to capture params, I know it's on the other side of it. So you still know this information, it's just, it, depending on what you want to do, you'll have to manipulate the stack a little bit more. It does make it a little more trickier because you do have to clean up the stack a little bit better. Um, because you said the nice thing about this is this just returns and cleans up your stack for you. It leaves these two guys here because it just moves the stack pointer. It doesn't go back and zero all this memory. That'd be a complete waste of time. So it, it just pops those, but in the case of returning a 64-bit int, it would push it here, and that would invalidate these arguments. So that, and so the other purpose of making this was that it'll be available for people to play with and do whatever you want with. Um, but that is my presentation on what I learned for 375.